Hi, my name is Kenneth and I'd like to welcome you to Crete's how-to mini-series. In today's segment, we'll be discussing ASTM C140, the test method for testing and sampling concrete masonry units. This test is typically performed to ensure that concrete units are performing to their respective requirements as specified in other ASTM standards. In today's example, we'll be testing load-bearing concrete masonry units. So the governing standard will be ASTM C90. If you're testing, say, pavers, you'd need to reference ASTM C936. And if you're testing segmented retaining wall units, you need to reference ASTM C1372. The first step is to sample six CMU. They should be full-sized units of similar configuration and dimensions, and they should be representative of the lot. Upon receiving them, the first thing we'll want to do is inspect them for any damage or cracks. Then, we'll want to mark them in such a way that they're always identifiable. The end of the block tends to get the job done. Now that they're marked, we can go ahead and grab our abrasive stone or wire brush, if you don't have one of these, and remove any loose material on the block. Now that the block are nice and clean, we'll go ahead and take the received weight. We'll record the weight, the time, and the place where it was taken. Now that the prep work is complete, we'll go ahead and start with the compression test method. We'll need the following. We'll need three block, capping material, a capping apparatus, and a compression machine. The three block being used for compression testing should be allowed to acclimate for 48 hours in laboratory conditions. They should be stored unstacked, and separated by at least a half inch on each side in temperatures of 75 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and a minimum relative humidity of 80%. If you're pressed for time and absolutely cannot wait that long, you can technically store them in the same way, but have a fan create an airstream over the block for at least four hours. You'll then have to start taking weights of block in two hour intervals until the increment of loss is less than 0.2%, which means it'll take at least six hours to condition. Before we begin capping, we'll want to make sure that our compression machine will be able to A, fit the block we will be testing, and B, handle the load. Our machine has a 400,000 pound capacity. If we assume that our block are standard 8x8x16s eight by eight by and have cells that are roughly 5.5 inch square, we can calculate that the surface area for the block is about 60 inches squared. Knowing that the block must have at least 2,000 psi compressive strength per ASTM C90, we know we'll need at least 120,000 pounds of force. In order to max out our machine, the block would need to have a compressive strength of about 6,600 psi, which is technically possible, but highly unlikely. So we can assume that our machine is capable, and therefore we do not need to cut coupons out of the block. If we were testing something like, say, a six by eight inch paver like this one, we would need to consider cutting coupons because at 8,000 psi, required minimum compressive strength per ASTM C936, a paver this size would take roughly 385,000 pounds of force. There are quite a few stipulations that come into play when cutting coupons, but you can reference section 7.2 and the annexes for each specific CMU type in ASTM C140-17 for more information. All right, now that we've verified that our equipment can handle it, the specimens we want to test, we will need to cap the specimens. For this step, we'll need to reference ASTM C1552. In 1552-03, we're given the choice to use high-strength gypsum or sulfur. There are definitely advantages and disadvantages to both, with most industrial facilities using sulfur capping due to its lower cost and quicker setting time, and labs using gypsum due to increased control and elimination of some safety concerns like burns. Either way, the capping material of choice is required to have a compressive strength of at least 3,500 psi within two hours. You have to make sure your capping material meets the requirement before you start testing. This is typically done using two inch compression cubes. For today's test, we'll be using gypsum. In order to batch it, we'll be using a 0.26 water to gypsum ratio as specified in 1552. You're allowed 0.26 to 0.30, but through testing, we found that 0.26 gives us the workability we want and the strength we need. Before batching though, we'll want to prepare our capping surfaces to ensure they are free of debris and have a little form oil on them. The requirements for capping surfaces are listed in section 5 of 1552-03, but in summary, we'll need a surface that is very level and very smooth. For this demo, we'll be using a capping plate. We'll spread out the gypsum into a thin, even layer across the plate. We'll then place the block and press firmly down. We need to ensure that the block is level, and we also need to take into consideration that the thickness of the cap should not exceed an eighth of an inch. 
Once placed, we'll allow the block to rest undisturbed for one to two hours so that the gypsum has a chance to harden. If you do remove the block before two hours, you must wait to test it until the youngest cap is at least two hours old. Now that our units are capped, we can go ahead and set up our compression machine. We've previously checked to make sure that it is in proper working condition, so now it's just a matter of setting up the parameters. ASTM C140-17 specifies that you can apply the load at any rate for the first half as long as the second half of the load is applied in such a way that the block takes at least one minute and up to two minutes to break. Since we know we will have to hit a minimum of 2,000 PSI, and we know that 2,000 PSI in our case will be roughly 120,000 pounds, we'll go ahead and set up our loading rate to 1,000 pounds per second. That loading rate will let us complete the test in roughly two minutes to meet spec, and give us a little leeway in case the block is stronger. C140 also states that the first block you break's results are valid as long as the second half of the load takes at least 30 seconds to break the block. We'll load it into the machine in the same orientation as it is to be used in the field. We'll now go ahead and give this an ID number so we can reference the digital file at a later date, let it know that we roughly have 60 inches squared of cross-sectional area, and we'll start it up. <laughs> Excellent. This machine gives us both the total load in pounds required to break the block as well as the compressive strength. We need to be careful when recording the data directly off of the machine because if you remember, we estimated our surface area to be roughly 60 square inches, when in reality it'll be something different. We'll worry about the actual compressive strength once we complete the absorption section of the test and we know the true surface area of the block. All right, now that we're done with the compression and cleanup, We'll move on to the absorption test. For this test, we'll need a balance, a ventilated oven, a dunk tank, a damp towel, a draining area, measurement tools, and a timer. We'll go ahead and take the remaining three block that we had previously labeled, cleaned off, and weighed. The same stipulations about using full-size units or coupons that applied to compression units also applied to absorption units. The only real difference is that an absorption unit coupon must be cut in such a way that it weighs at least 20% as much as the original received weight of the full unit. Each masonry unit has its own requirements for measuring as spelled out in their individual annex within C140-17. But for block, we'll need to measure the width across the top and bottom, the height on each face, and the length on each face. We will also need to measure the face shell thickness at the minimum point roughly half inch from the top of the unit is manufactured, as well as the minimum web thickness for each web. The first step is to soak the specimens in 60 to 80 degree Fahrenheit water for 24 to 28 hours. The soaking tank must be big enough such that the top of the specimen is at least six inches under water, the specimens are separated by at least an eighth of an inch from each other, and they're at least an eighth of an inch from the bottom of the tank. To achieve this, you can use a wire rack, mesh, or grating as long as it does not cover more than 10% of the surface area of the block. In our case, we have a wire rack that has served us well. Now that the block has been soaking for 24 hours, we'll need to take the weight of the block while submerged. This is recorded as WI, or immersed weight. We'll then take it out of the water tank and let it drip dry for 60 seconds on a rack that has a 3 8 of an inch or coarser wire mesh. At the end of 60 seconds, we'll give it a quick wipe with a damp towel to remove any surface water and record its weight. This will be recorded as WS, or saturated weight. Upon recording the data, we'll transfer them over to a 230 degree Fahrenheit oven and allow them to dry for at least 24 hours. At 24 hours, we'll take them out and weigh them. They'll then go back into the oven for another two hours. At 26 hours, we'll take them out and weigh them again. We'll continue this two-hour drying and weighing process until the increment of loss is less than 0.2%. Once we hit that, we can record the lowest weight observed as WD, or oven dry weight. Now that we have all the data, we can go ahead and perform the calculations and ensure we have all of the report requirements. And that's a wrap. Thank you for joining me and we'll see you in the next installment.